So the church has us meditate upon the story of the flood this week. Remember, as we talked about previously, the, um, these readings were chosen for the education of the catechumens. So give me an example of how you might think this story might be relevant for the catechumens. Baptism. Excellent. Baptism, yeah. Baptism and chrismation. So why does the church have us meditate on this? Why, does it, why do we see in this a type for baptism? St. Peter says in his first epistle, chapter 3, that the, uh, he says that the flood and those who died in the flood and those who lived in, uh, through the flood, eight persons were saved in the ark, he says, during the flood. He says this corresponds to baptism. Now let me ask you a question. How often do our catechists compare baptism to the flood? I think it's very rare today. And that is how far we are from apostolic Christianity. If St. Peter, right? St. Peter, the Apostle, if St. Peter the Apostle, the great Apostle, if he catechized about, the, about baptism, as his primary model, the flood story, how far are we from the teachings of Peter? St. Paul compared the water of the Red Sea and the crossing thereof and the cloud and the supernatural food and drink, the manna and the quail flesh and the water from the rock, to baptism confirmation, chrismation, and the Eucharist. This is St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. St. Peter refers to the flood. He says, this corresponds to baptism. Right? St. Paul compares baptism, in fact the whole initiation into the church, with the crossing of the Red Sea. Is this how we still catechize today? You might say, oh, Arvuna, I, I think you're a little mad. How do these things compare to the great catechesis we have today? Well, let me show you an example. Here is St. Peter's, Saint Peter's uh, teaching on this subject. St. Peter says, This is in chapter 3 of his first epistle, starting in verse oh, 19. Christ also went to the spirits who were in prison, in which he went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah during the building of the ark in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, so not some sort of a washing, but rather as an appeal to God for a clear conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Notice the connection of baptism and resurrection. This is the ancient teaching of the church. Again, here's a place where modern catechesis has seemed to have failed. How many baptism classes go on and on without a mention of the resurrection of Jesus? We say it every Sunday in the Creed. We believe in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins and the resurrection of the body and life of the world to come. That's the teaching of the church. That's the good news that we are to go out and proclaim, go out and baptize all nations in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Somehow we got lost in soup kitchens and social work and who knows what. You know? But that's our job. Now look what Peter says. St. Peter says, eight were saved. Now why eight? Why would he say eight? 
What does the number eight have to do with baptism? Any idea? On what day did Christ rise from the dead? The eighth day. The followers of the church saw in the resurrection of Jesus. If you look at all the four resurrection narratives in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all begin with the exact same words. When the Sabbath was over, near the dawn of the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene and the other women disciples of the Lord went to the tomb very early. And what happens? They found the tomb was open. Right? A lot of times we think that Jesus rose from the dead at that moment. No, Jesus was already, He was gone. The tomb was open so the women disciples of the Lord could see that He was risen. An angel was there who rolled, open, or rolled aside the, the door so they could see. And He says, Behold the tomb where He laid. He's not here. He's risen from the dead. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Go, tell His disciples. He's risen. And they run off scared. And so Jesus appears to them and says, Now, now that you've seen me, go. And so they go tell the, the disciples, the Lord, the apostles. That's the seventh day Jesus rested, just like God rested in the tomb. God rested in the tomb. God rested on the seventh day from all the work which He had done. The Sabbath. Right? Christ rests in the tomb on the Sabbath, on the seventh day. And so, the early church, you can see it as early as the epistle of Barnabas. You can see it here in, uh, in Peter's epistle. And a number of other examples of the reference to the number eight, the eighth day, the day of the resurrection. Right? It's the fulfillment of the old creation. It's the resurrection of the old creation, the restoration. So it's the first day of a new creation and the eighth day of the old. It's this hinge between the old and the new. And this is why baptismal fonts historically have eight sides. In fact, baptistries in the old days when they were built outside the church building were usually eight-sided, octagonal. Very rich. Very rich. A whole baptism class could be spent. A whole RCIA class could be spent right here in the first epistle of Peter. I wonder how many RCIA classes today ever open the Bible to First Peter and read it to those preparing for baptism. How sad. And the resurrection... What does the resurrection have to do with baptism? Well, everything. St. Paul says in Romans chapter 6, the epistle reading which is required at every liturgical celebration of baptism in every apostolic church on the face of the earth, all of you who have been baptized into Christ have died with Him, have been buried with Him, and raised with Him to newness of life. Romans 6. And if we have been raised with Him to newness of life, if we have shared in a death like His, we shall share in a resurrection like His. We shall share in His glory. Why is this so important? Because we're not supposed to die. That's not part of our nature. God created man to live. This is what the epistle or the book of wisdom says, chapter chapter three, uh, chapters two and three. God made man for in the image of his immortality. Man's made in the image and likeness of God. God's immortal. That was our purpose. To live. God was going to live with us forever in the Garden of Eden. And so Jesus came to restore all of that. More on that later on. But also you know that St. Paul says likewise in his epistle to the Corinthians. Chapter 10 of the first epistle where he compares, as I said, the crossing of the Red Sea to baptism. He says, Do you not know that our fathers were all under the cloud? All passed through the sea and were baptized into Moses in the sea and in the cloud. And all ate and drank the same supernatural food and the same supernatural drink. And they drank from the rock which followed and that rock was Christ. He says these are types, images for us. Images for us. Called typology. Probably have heard that before. You might hear, ah, oh, the fathers of the church, they were big into typology. Well, yeah, because the apostles were. 
This is the apostolic faith. God does not change. He's immutable. So in every age, in every episode of salvation history, God is always doing the same thing. It's just the set changes. The characters change. But God, the director, is doing the same thing. And so you see these images, these echoes of the Word of God, the creative power of God throughout all eternity. And so why does St. Peter tell us that the flood corresponds to baptism? Well, let's look at some examples here. We find in Genesis chapter 6, the church has us begin reading this this week, from chapter 6 we hear about the sons of God going to the daughters of men. Who are they? Well, you might hear today Jehovah's Witnesses or someone tell you, oh, these are the angels having you know, relations with women. Well, if you've had any philosophy classes, you know that's impossible. Okay? It doesn't work. and surely not going to impregnate them. But... That is not the way this was interpreted by the fathers of the church, the great doctors. St. Augustine, St. John Chrysostom, St. Jerome, St. Ambrose, St. Ephraim, I could go on and on, all interpreted the sons of God as a reference to the line of Seth and the daughters of men as a reference to the women of the line of Cain. Of course, it makes sense in the context. In chapter 4 and 5, we heard about two lines from Adam. The line of the sons of men, the sons of Adam, and the lines of the sons of God. The line of Seth is said to be in the image and likeness of God. You look like your parents. So this is the sons of God versus, these are the covenantal line versus the wicked line without God in rebellion. Right? The descendancy of Cain. As I mentioned last time, you can see the contrast of these two lines in Genesis 4 and 5. One climaxes the seventh generation from Adam through Cain is Lamech a murderer and a polygamist. The seventh generation through, from Adam through Seth, Enoch, who walked with God and he was not, for God took him so he should not see death. Stark contrast. right? One is in the image and likeness of God as it says in the beginning of chapter 5. The other is not. One is the covenantal people of God. The other is not. But what's the tragedy? The tragedy is the covenantal people of God are often attracted to the things of the world. Right? It's the story, of course, of the Old Testament. If you've read it, you know. The men of Israel always going after the women of the nations around them. Think about the Moabite girls in the book of Numbers. And what happens? They engage in cult prostitution and then they are led to worship of the foreign gods. And now they have broken the covenant. And that's what's happened here. We have the people of God going outside of their covenant to non-covenantal people who are in sin and polytheism. And the people of God now turn to polytheism. And so all of mankind is now corrupt. Except for one man, Noah. He was a righteous man, it says. Perfect in his generation. And so God makes a covenant with him, it says in chapter 7. I will make my covenant with you. I will make my covenant with you. Now what is covenant? What is covenant? Relationship. Yeah. Right? Even today you sign a covenant when you buy a house in a neighborhood. There might be under it might be a, a covenant. I will not paint my house bright pink or something. You know, they have certain rules. Be a nice neighbor. I won't do certain things while I live in this neighborhood. I will do this thing. I will not do that. That's a covenant, a deal, a contract. You're making a relationship and you're signing your name to it. Covenant, relationship, contract. God is making His covenant with Noah. And when man comes into covenantal relationship, when man is brought back in a relationship with God, you have life. All of the covenants that God makes with man are all life-giving until it climaxes with the great covenant, Jesus Christ, the God-man, who says, if I am in you and you are in me, I am the, the Father is in you and the Father, we are all one. Right? You are brought back to life and if that's the case, I will raise you up on the last day, he says. 
That's the great covenant. But all of these covenants before with Noah, Abraham, and the rest are all preliminary stages of relationship being restored between God and man. And so here we find a covenant of life. Noah, because God is making a covenant with him, notice it's God making covenant with man, not the other way around. God always comes to man to bring him to life. And so Noah is going to be preserved alive because of this covenant. And all those with him. He's the covenant, covenantal mediator. And so, if you didn't catch the covenant theme, you hear after that line, seven, 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 seven. Seven pairs of animals. After seven days, the, wall, the flood came. After seven, seven. You hear sevens throughout the text now. Why seven? Because seven in Hebrew, Sheva in Hebrew, seven, is the same root as Shava, to, as to swear an oath, to make a covenant. And so in the Old Testament, in covenantal context, you always get sevens, and so that's what you see here. And so what happens in chapter seven, we hear about the waters coming over the earth, darkness upon the face of the deep. Just like you saw at the beginning of chapter 1. There is decreation now. Everything is reversed. The water covers the earth. Even the separation of the water above and the water below now collapses into one. It says the windows of the great of the heavens open and the and the fountains of the deep burst forth. So there is water Above, below, and in between. The rakia, the firmament, is gone. That's separation. And so, of course, the waters cover the earth. And it says, there is no life left. Right? All of life, all of the animals that had the breath of life were snuffed out. Except for Noah and those with him in the ark. And at that moment, when we're back at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, we hear God sends the wind. The wind. Remember in chapter 1 it said, And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of this chaos. And God said, Let there be light. And so that's what happens again. He sends the wind. The Ruach Elohim, the Spirit of God. It's the same in the Hebrew and in the Greek. The word for spirit and wind. And so the wind comes and parts the clouds, parts the rain, parts the storm, and the sunlight pours in. And the waters begin to evaporate from the earth. And the storm is over. You know, when the wind comes in, you can see the clouds part. The storm is over. The sun comes out. Everything begins to dry up. This is Genesis 1 all over again. And then we hear how Noah eventually goes out of the ark. He comes out of the ark. Before he comes out, we hear about the dove with the olive branch, right, from which we get our olive oil. And so we can see why the fathers look back at this and they see baptism. There is water, the great abyss. Back then they dunked you under the water, they didn't just trickle water over your head. So the big abyss, the big lake, the sea, the baptismal font, in which you are dunked into in which the Spirit of God comes to rest upon you. Like we'll see later with the baptism of Jesus. And also, the oil of the olive. Right? From which the bishop or the priest takes that oil and anoints you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and you receive the Spirit of God. So, water and Spirit. Even the reference to the olive oil. And now Noah comes out of the ark, a new creation. He comes out, you hear imagery right out of Genesis chapter 1. God says, be fruitful and multiply. He even gives them the menu, just like back in chapter 1. And so the church gives us this reading. First and foremost, for the catechumens who are preparing for their coming baptism. But, as the bishop mentioned last week, also very early, the church realized that the faithful, already baptized, are in need of rebaptism. Right? We all, all of us, have failed to live up to the baptismal grace we have been given. 
What have we done with the great gift that we have received in baptism? Are we a temple of the Holy Spirit? Do we live like one? Do we treat our bodies as if they are not ours but God's? And so the church gives us an opportunity in these 40 days in the great fast to prepare like a catechumen again to receive again the grace of baptism on Holy Pascha, to participate again in the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. And this is, of course, what baptism is all about. More on that in a later talk.